If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to Psalm 77. In my distress, I called to the Lord, says David in 2 Samuel. Where does, uh, where does prayer begin? For this psalmist and that's writing this passage, I think it's long the same idea of what David says in 2 Samuel is that it begins in prayer. And like all genuine theology, it begins at times in pain. And prayer is not reciting a formula or, or repeating a prescribed uh, sort of moment, uh, like I now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord. Or maybe even we have to be careful about even our Father who art in heaven. In other words, it is the aspect of a uh, not a self-satisfied soul, but it, it, contemplating all the comforts of what we have in this world and where we live. Uh, but it's, it, and it's not just an aspect of sort of a syrupy sentimentalism or the feeling that, well, our God's in heaven and all is right with the world. Whatever else you might think about the kind of prayer, it's a million miles away from where this psalmist lives. And you begin by looking at the beginning of this passage. They are listed also in the back of your notes. And it says, I cried out in verse 1. I cried out. Verse 2, I sought and stretched out. Verse 3, I groaned, I was troubled, I mused, I pondered. In verse 4, I was dazed and could not speak. Verse 6, all night I was in deep distress. And for this person, prayer truly begins with the feelings of pain. And what caused his pain? Well, the reality is we don't know. We don't know what the psalmist doesn't tell us. Perhaps it, it was a time when there was maybe a national crisis or a catastrophe that had fallen the children of Israel, as when the Babylonian army marched into Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and carried away thousands of Jews into captivity, leaving the nation sort of devastated. Perhaps it's that. Perhaps it's the psalmist reflecting upon the experience of those that were in exile, that have gone off to Babylon, that have been taken away, and they are now experiencing the cajoling and the sneering and the contempt of those captors as they look at these now slaves or whatever they will be and are they saying where where's your god now is he blind is he deaf is he paralyzed that he is not able to move anymore or maybe it's even more personal out of the distress and depths i cried unto you O lord he says here, I prayed that you would hear my cry. He uses the word depths in one translation. The word in our translation is the word distress. The depths are those, what are the depths? Well, it's those times when a mother or father hold an all night vigil between the day their child is well and the day that he will be well again. The depths are when the doctor comes in the room and takes you by the hand and says, I'm sorry, there's nothing else we can do. The depths are when maybe the candlelight flickers in your marriage or in your job or your work. Those are the depths. Sooner or later, all of us know these distress moments. And perhaps it is born in those times of the depths and distress is what this psalm is talking about. There are four movements or stanzas in the psalm. They're listed on the back of your bulletin. We've been dealing with the first one, the first six verses that we might call the troubles or the distress here. There are two images in the troubles in this psalm. They recur again and again. One is found in verse 2, I stretched out my untiring hands. It's the image of a person who is drowning. And the idea is that the floods have come over his head and he's drowning. Another example of this is found in Psalm 69 where it says, Save me, O God, for the waters are up to my neck as I sink in the miry depths. The other image that is also idea here is that of the pit. The pit was a deep cistern where a criminal would be placed. We'd be lowered down. All you have to do is read Jeremiah chapter 38, and you see Jeremiah was lowered into a dried out well or a pit. 
and he was dropped in the pit and there he sank, I believe, all the way up to his waist in mud. That's the depths or the troubles, that place where pain and prayer come together. Some of you understand exactly what it means to be in a pit. What is that place where prayer is born? The Irish poet Yeats put it this way, love has pitched its mansion in the place of garbage. For nothing can be sole or whole that has not been first rent. Sometimes God has to knock us down before he can pick us up. The second thing we see here is, first of all, we've seen the troubles in this psalm. And that leads to the second stanza we call questions. Questions, it appears that there are six of them here, but we're going to say that possibly there are seven questions. Notice the questions that are found in verses 7 through 10. Will the Lord reject us forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has, he for, has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he, anger, has, he, has he in anger withheld his compassion? Now I want you to take your pen out and I want you to write this down. You don't have to turn to it, but I want you to write down Exodus 34. Exodus 34. You can either write it in your Bible, not the church Bible, but in your Bible, or you can put it down in the notes on the back of your sheet. But Exodus 34, and the verses are 5, 6, and 7. In that passage in Exodus 34, it is the children of Israel were being prepared to enter into the promised land. And so God comes down in the cloud, and he speaks to them through Moses. This is around the same time of the giving of the Ten Commandments. And in the passage, he says this, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the father to the third and fourth generation. Now, what is taking place here in Exodus 34 is a Old Testament creed, or what we would call an Old Testament confession, or an Old Testament statement of faith. In other words, God is saying to the people of Israel that he has now led them out into the desert, away from Egypt. And he's now declaring to them, this is the kind of God that you're going to worship. In other words, he's saying, this is the kind of God that I am. Now in Psalm 77, each one of those great characteristics that we mentioned back in Exodus 34 is called into question. The faithfulness of God, verse 7 of Psalm 77. Will the Lord reject forever? That calls God's election of Israel into question. Will he never show his favor again in verse 7? His hesed, or the word is compassion, has it vanished? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Is there something wrong with his memory? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? And, and what, what the writer does here is one by one, the psalmist is questioning the great attributes of the covenant God of Israel. Have you ever done that? I'll ask you a question this morning. The question is, why are these questions in the Bible? In other words, don't they seem inappropriate to say this to God? And yet, dear people, there have been in times when we have said these very questions to God. Now, to understand this, there are two answers. First of all, they're in the Bible because we do not serve an antiseptic God. Our God is not removed. He's not remote. He's not untouched. He's not untouchable. That's not our God. But rather, we serve a God who came into the very depths of our human condition. And according to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about Jesus and he was put, put to the test in every conceivable way as we are. 
Just as we have been tested, Jesus was tested, and yet the difference between Jesus' test and our test is that Jesus never sinned. That's the exception, that's the difference. This means that Jesus was not a stranger to questions. What was Jesus' question on the cross? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The second reason that these questions are in the Bible is that there is no pathway to Easter without, first of all, going by Good Friday. You can't get to Easter without, first of all, leading you through Good Friday. Dr. Garner Taylor is a uh, black pastor in New York City back in the 50s. He tells a story from when he was preaching in Louisiana during the Depression time. And electricity was just coming into that part of the country and he was out in a rural black church and just happened to have one little light bulb hanging from the ceiling that lit up the whole building. I've been in a church like that. It was in Honduras, a night service, and it was one uh, gas, gas, uh, uh, propane lamp that lit up the whole building. Well, he was there in that building. He's preaching away, and in the middle of the sermon, all of a sudden, the electricity goes out. And the place is sort of pitch black, and he didn't know what to say, being a young preacher. And he stumbled around until one of the elderly deacons sitting in the back of the church cried out, Preacher, we can still see Jesus in the dark. You know, the, the feeling is, is that sometimes that's the only time we can see him is in the dark. And the good news of the gospel of, is that whether we can see him in the dark or not, he can see us. He can see us in the dark. Now, a lot of mod uh, modern trans uh, uh, translations render verse 10 of Psalm 77 as sort of an introduction to the rest of the psalm. This is how the NIV translates it. If you have the NIV, I will appeal to the ears of the right hand of the Most High. But there is a variant reading to this in the Hebrew, and in some ways it may be a better way of stating what the verse is saying. Verse 10 is not to be read as an introduction to the rest of the psalm, but as a conclusion to the first part of the psalm. And in some ways, it's being written as a seventh question. This is how the New English Bible translates: Has God's right, has God's right, <coughs> excuse me, has God's right hand lost its grip? It's almost like he's saying, does it hang powerless, withered, the arm of God at his side? New American Bible says, has the right hand of the Most High changed? By the way, this is the uh, presupposition of a school of theology that is in our day, sort of more of a liberal theology, it's called process theology, that God changes and does the best he can with what he has. And ultimately, uh, in other words, this, idea, this theology says, ultimately God is not in control. In other words, God just deals with forces as they show up, and then he takes care of it after that. Uh, he can feel our pain, but he can't really make it go away. Uh, this is also called, I think it's been 30 years, 35 years ago, what is called the openness of God theology. It has a diminished view of God, a view that God doesn't really, God really doesn't know the future. Uh, and their illustration is, they say, for example, that God doesn't really know who's going to win the Super Bowl. And uh, I will concede that uh, God, I think, doesn't really care a lot about who wins the Super Bowl, other than the Bears, because I'm wearing Bears colors. Uh, but I do believe that God does know. He knows who's going to win. And he knows everything that has happened and is happening and will happen. 
In other words, I believe that the passage is saying is that the right hand of God has not lost its grip. That he truly is an all-powerful God. Now, number three, the next two stanzas are the what I would call confession, or a better word that we see here is the word remember. And I think in some ways this is the turning point in the psalm. The psalm begins with pain that leads to questions and leads to despair. And then comes this turning point in verse 11. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your words and consider all your mighty deeds. In other words, the surest way to reconnect when you're in the depths is to remember how good God has been to you. There's a song that comes out of the black church tradition. It says, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? Oh, where would I be? I think that's a good understanding. Where would we be if it hadn't been for the Lord on our side? I think that's what the psalmist is talking about. I will remember, I will meditate, I will think about who God is and what he has done. And his faithfulness in days gone by, and I will let it sink into my soul. I will meditate upon this. For us, as we look back at 2020, we would look back at it and in many ways say it hasn't been the greatest year to look back on. But we can also look back and we can see that God was there. And there are moments in our lives when we can see this is what God did. And that he was there to help us. The psalmist says that he will remember all of God's mighty deeds, his works among the nations and the peoples. God is at work everywhere in this world. And may we be people that never forget that. He is the one who raises up kings. He is the one who brings forth princes and puts them up or puts them down. Who's ever elected on January 5th in Georgia, God knows. And God Almighty will still be God Almighty. It's when we remember this that we come back to ourselves. Many of you have heard of the, the movie or the book called The Notebook. The Notebook is a love story between a man named Noah and his wife, Allie. Most of the movie is about their young love together and how they met and how they fell in love. But every now and then the movie jumps to the future, which is our time and the other end, and showing them in their old age. Allie at this point has developed Alzheimer's and she is a nursing home. And Noah doesn't have to be there, but he insists on staying with her. Some years before this had taken place, Allie had written down the story of their love in a notebook. And every day Noah comes and they have lunch together. And Noah takes out the notebook and he reads Allie the story of their love. And as he reads the story, her eyes seem to open every now and then. And in some ways we could say she comes back to him for just a few minutes. I believe, dear people, that's what the Bible is. The Bible is God's covenant love story for his people through all the ages. And when we're in the depths and it seems that the Lord has rejected us forever and his mercy is gone, we take out the notebook and we read, in the beginning, God created. Or God delivered his people out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Or God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And when we read, we come back to reality. And we know who we are. Because we know who God is. And we know what he has done. And that is the demonstration of his unfailing love for us. Lastly, number four, the final stanza, or the conclusion. In verse 16, you have a thunderstorm psalm. 
The water saw you, the depths were convulsed, the thunder was whirl in the whirlwind, lightning lit up the world, the earth trembled and quaked, your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters. And here's the title here, because the title of this psalm, your footprints were unseen. The unseen footprints. We often don't immediately uh, see how God is at work in the circumstances that we are that we are going through are swirling all around us, especially when you're in the pit and you're sinking in the depths and you're wondering, where's God? But the witness of Scripture here is, and the people of God through the ages, is that God has never left His people alone. And that he is there to guide us even in those torturous times and those pathways of life. Even though his footprints are frequently unseen. It's like the, uh, I think it's an English writer who writes, I fled from him down the night and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled from him down the labyrinth of ways. Over my own mind in the midst of tears, I hid from him. And under, under running laughter up vistas hopes, I sped and shot and precipitated down titanic glooms of chasms of fears. I fled him and I fled him and I ran from those strong feet that followed, that followed after. That was written by Francis Thompson. It's called The Hound of Heaven. Francis Thompson was an alcoholic on the streets of London. He was a drug addict, he was in the gutter, he was utterly lost, and he is running from. But behind him, invisibly and imperceptibly, seemed to come those feet, those strong feet, that followed, that followed after him. Let me close with this. You're all asking, where in the world did I get the title of the sermon? Well, there's an apocryphal story called Bell and the Dragon. This is a story about Daniel in Babylon. And Bell was an idol that is one that consumes a lot of food and sheep and meat and all kinds of wine and grain. However, what was taking place is that the priests of Bel that were keeping the temple were really the ones that were eating all of the food that was being put out for Bel. So the king comes to Daniel and he asks Daniel, why, why don't you sacrifice something to the god Bel? And Daniel basically laughs in his face and says, that's not God. That, that's an idol. He can't eat anything. He's as empty on the outside and he is, he is as empty on the inside. And the king looks at him and says, well, that can't be true. And so he called all the other priests together, the priests of Bel, and, and says, well, Daniel says, Daniel says that Bel isn't eating the food you put out. Well, what's taking place? What's happening here? And the priest replied, why don't you seal off the building and not let anybody in at night? And all the food and all that will be piled up next to the, the idol bell. And you can tell, tell us whether or not Bell has eaten all the food. Now, the priests are telling him this all the while. They have a secret little door that they can come in from the back. And they would come in and they would sneak the food out and the king wouldn't know. But Daniel, before they, after they put the food all down, what he does is that he sprinkles ashes and dust all around on the floor. And sure enough, as the priest had put all the food down there and everything was locked in behind the door, during the night, the priest came in and did what they always did. They would took away the food and they would eat it themselves. The next morning, the king came and said, is the door locked? And the priest would reply, yes, sir, it is. Is the seal still on the door, unbroken? Yes, sir, it's still there. Looks like old Daniel is a liar. But then Daniel says to the king, well, let's open the door. 
let's go inside. And they look inside and he says, look at the floor and see footprints that are all over the place. That's what happened to the food. The priests came in the night and they snuck it away and they have eaten it. Bell is an idol. He's not a god. You don't need to give him any food. Look at the footprints. You know, you can see the devil's footprints. But the footprints of our God are unseen. He says here they lead through the sea, through the depths, where he will walk with us, where he lives within us, when he has promised never to leave us or forsake us. You know, the ending of this psalm is verse 20. It says, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. It's interesting. What does that recall? It recalls Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. But sometimes, it also says in the psalm, he leads me through the valley of the shadow of death. But always, though, he leads his people to that land where there will be no more tears or sorrow or death. No more pits. No more muck and mire to sink into. But we shall forever bask in the presence of our great and living God. Even in the depths of 2020, may we remember that God is at work. Unseen footprints that show us that He, our God, has been with us and that He is faithful in the year ahead. Let's bow in prayer. Lord of all, we are thankful for your demonstration of your power to us. And there are moments, there are questions that happen in our lives. And Lord, we are glad that you are not unwilling to hear us in our despair, like the psalmist and what he is saying. But may we always remember what the conclusion is to be. It is to be a conclusion that always depends upon our God. And that we see his true footprints even at times when they are unseen, but that you are there and that you care about us. Lord, we are thankful as we, uh, on this first Sunday of this new year of 2021, that we are dependent upon you and we are thankful for your kindness to us. We pray for this year ahead. May in everything you be glorified and lifted up, and we will thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.